Greater Houston is, uh, Creative Association is where I met Frank uh, six or seven years ago, and he's in charge of that. He has a board of directors that serves, but he's basically the one that gets everything done right, Frank. Right? I get the deal to work. He gets all the coats out and, and gets food there for us to eat. Gets the speakers lined up, and we here at the board know how, you know, uh, uh, laborious that is in getting speakers every month. So uh, we're, we're glad to have him here, and he has a degree in electrical engineer, holds seven patents in the area of electronic <clears throat> oil exploration. Uh, after his retirement, he then took time and took courses at the Institute for Creation and Research Graduate School, and is currently president of the Greater Houston Creation Association. He is also co-founder of the Texas for Better Science Education and founder of the Texas for Superior Education. Now, friends, there is a battle out there for centuries, not centuries, sorry, decades, with the, with the Texas School Board and what they do to the school books that teach our children. We all know of the situation about teaching creation, where well, it goes a whole lot further than that. But that's probably, for me personally, that's the, the thing that irritates me the most. But uh, Frank is out there with other people fight the battle to get those things done. And so I want you guys to give Frank a nice warm welcome. Thank you, Pat. Great words. Okay. Let's see. I'm, uh, if I can get this crew computer oriented. Okay. Let's go ahead. Uh, Pat was saying, talking about the Greater Houston Creation Association. We're an organization that studies science with the assumption that God did what he said in the Bible. Of course, most science is done with the assumption that there is no God, no God, or anything supernatural for that matter. So when people of that kind of assumption go out and look at evidence, they see one thing. People who, who are no God and trust his word go out and look at the evidence. They see something else. And it often is a conflict, and it's often surprising. It's a contrast to what we're taught in school frequently. So I want to give you some... Uh, information about some of the current things going on where that kind of contrast exists that uh, you may find very interesting. The GHCA has monthly meetings, a website given there, a newsletter, and you can sign up for the newsletter on, you know, on our website or there's a sign-up sheet on the table over here on the right, on my right. Uh, okay. In the past decade or so, Scientists have been uh, looking at dinosaur bones, and they find out with the large bones, they can actually find soft tissue, still not completely decayed tissue, inside those bones. Because the interior of the bones has been fairly protected from the surroundings pretty well. Now, conventional ideas of uh, history of the Earth would say, well, the Earth's 4.7 billion years old. And dinosaurs would have ages anywhere from 65 million to 150 million. So that's the way they normally think, and they're absolutely confident of that, no doubt about it. But it's a, uh, it flies in the face of that to find soft tissue that's uh, not completely decayed. Uh, that soft tissue should be completely decayed in, uh, normally in a year. Actually, if you put some uh, tissue in a, a jar of water and close it up and let it stand, it'll be a slimy mess in just a few days. And you won't be able to find much structure in that after a few weeks. Uh -huh. So it, it's really hard for them to explain this. Okay, now in this slide, you see some of the amazing things that uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer found in 2006 from a Tyrannosaurus rex femur. These are actual blood vessels, okay? And sometimes they found red blood cells inside them. Uh, and these are still flexible and stretchy and elastic. Uh, these are actual blood cells. 
You might look at that and you notice that there is a nucleus in those cells. Uh, mammal blood cells don't, red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They're kind of unique about that, but uh, reptilian ones do. So uh, that's evidence that, you know, no, somebody didn't cut their finger and bleed on this. Okay, that's real reptilian stuff there. And as this process has gone on <coughs> over the last decade, they've gotten into more and more and more detail proving that this is real dinosaur tissue with molecular structure of many of the proteins and so on that you would expect to find there. It's there. Okay. One of the ideas that came up to try to stretch this idea of how long can this be lasted, uh, last longer, uh, somebody came up with the idea that the iron in the uh, red blood cells could act like formaldehyde in a certain extent. And it cross, causes cross-linking, which helps preserve some of these tissues. Uh, but experiments uh, with that could make this some stuff last up to maybe two years. But still, you know, that's a vast difference from 65 million years. It doesn't really explain a whole lot. Maybe it's a step in the right direction, but just one. Okay. So here's a couple of articles, I'll read you a couple of quotes, uh, fairly late articles uh, about this kind of thing where a whole bunch of authors got to write, and these are open source articles, so you can write them, and they're on, listed on your handout. Exceptionally preserved organic remains are known throughout the vertebrate fossil record. It's not just dinosaurs, in other words. We examined samples from eight Cretaceous dinosaurs, offered the opportunity to investigate relationships, physiology, and behavior of long extinct animals. So previously, they hadn't been able to see anything but bones. Now they start seeing all these uh, uh, soft tissue relationships, and that's exciting. Okay, another article. Uh, <coughs> That last one was just last June published. Uh, this one in uh, POLS 1, which is an open publishing. Uh, 11 collagen protein peptide sequences, uh, pro peptides, subunits of proteins, sequences recovered from chemical extracts of dinosaur bones were mapped into molecular models of vertebrate collagen. This supports the hypothesis that the peptides are produced by the extinct organisms and suggests that chemical mechanisms for survival. Well, great, suggested. How about something that's testable? All right, we can have a different uh, viewpoint. Creationists have been challenging this institution doing this work <coughs> with one simple idea. How about C14 date the soft tissue? Radiocarbon 14 dating uh, could tell you how old it is. But they already know, they, they think, well, we know it's 68 million years old or something like that. So we don't need to do that. But in fact, of course, since it's carbon in all that tissue, you can't C14 date it and it should work very well. Uh, some creationists have in fact done some of that work, but let's look at radioactive carbon-14. It's useful to know that it come, it's generated in the atmosphere. When cosmic rays come in from outer space, they hit a the, the nucleus of a nitrogen atom, it turns one of the protons into a neutron and it becomes C14. And that C14 builds up to an equilibrium level, and half of it decays away every 5,730 years. So you have 5,730 years decreases to half, and another 5,730 years decreases to a quarter, the next 5,730 years decreases to an eighth, and so on. So you can measure that process, and you can predict 
uh, if you measure what percentage is still there, you can say, well, we can calculate then how long that process has been going on. Uh, when it gets out to something like 70,000 years, it's getting uh, too small an amount to measure reliably. Start having trouble with that. But it's good out to that age. So that's why the normal people say, well, it'd be useful to do this. Here's a group of German scientists working independent of any institutions. Here's a bunch of, uh, he's got it a little bit off screen here, but this Triceratops, Hadrosaurus, Allosaurus, and Archocanthosaurus. Different species of dinosaurs. And they're measuring the C14 in there, and they come up with these kinds of ages. Tens of thousands of years, not tens of millions of years. Okay, now that's what uh, creationists like me suspected would be the case. And there's some of the evidence. Well, they've, they've done some more of that, this group, and here's a table of some of that. Again, here are the ages out here with all these different samples of different dinosaurs. And more of the same thing, so that, that conf confirms it. Uh, there's a group called the Creation Research Society that has been working on this problem too. And they charted a little bit different way. Here are the C14 ages for all, all these uh, samples. And this number down here, and they've, they've ordered it so that these numbers are in order. This is the, the age of the rock strata by conventional geology, the age of the rock strata that uh, these samples, that these fossils were found in. So you have 10 million years, 30, 50, 60s, 70s, 100s, and out here to 505,000. This is the whole span of life up to 10 million years ago. Okay, it's a whole geologic column. Uh, and it all has C14 in it. This is a shocker uh, for conventional theorists anyway. It's kind of a joy to my heart. There's another, here's another list. Uh, this is all kinds of uh, material that has a lot of carbon in it. Uh, marble, for example, it has a lot of carbon in it, basically compressed shells. Uh, then shells of various sorts and whalebone, marble, wood, anthracite, coal is very hard, dense coal. Uh, Notice they start with the largest amounts of C14 and decreases from there, and we're going to go down the list. So these dates would be correspond to something like uh, 30 or 40,000 years up here. And as you go down the list, and there's more and more and more, 90 samples here, and these are the smallest ones. These graphites here, it's all, all carbon, of course. These graphites are pre-Cambrian. They are before the first life started, supposedly, in the, in the fossil record. And yet, in other words, it's 540 million years old by con conventional thinking, but it's still got C14 in it. It's, it's uh, very small amounts. So this would be uh, like 70,000 years old by C14. Uh, 500 and something million years old by conventional thinking. So here's direct evidence that uh, uh, some of our conventional thinking has problems, big problems. Okay, let's look at uh, that geologic column, for example. This is one of my favorite uh, cross sections of geology on Earth. This runs from the Grand Canyon here, up northwest through Zion Canyon in uh, southern Utah. Right over here is Bryce Canyon. You, you, some of you have probably been to these places. Yeah, they're spectacular. Uh, you can stand on the 
probably on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and look at all the strata over here. Grand Canyon cuts down through this bottom layer. And this, this black division there is known as the Great Unconformity. Everything down here is just solid bedrock. And then there's all this stratified layers. Uh, this tapete sandstone down here. It has sand and gravel and uh, pebbles and cobbles and then boulders. And boulders as big as a small, big garage or a small house. And all that stuff got moved by water and deposited by water. So it had to be enough water moving fast enough to move the rocks side of the garage. Uh, that's amazing. What's more amazing, this this, that layer covers half of North America. Then runs over to Europe, down through the Mideast, into North Africa. This is a world scale event. So this is the kind of thing, but that's where life started. And you have aquatic stuff down here, and then um, quadrupeds and fish started growing feet by evolutionary thinking and then age of the dinosaurs up here. All of this material has C14 in it, wherever there is carbon deposited. So that means it's less than 70,000 years old. All of it. But wait, doesn't dating by slow decay in isotopes like uranium, strontium, potassium, argon, and others prove the conventional age dating? Uh, that's long thought to be the case. Let's look at how that works just a little bit. Okay, this is the, the uh, traditional analogy to explain how this decay process works. You start with some amount of sand, and it's assumed it start in the top of an hourglass like that. There's an orifice hill, so a little bit of it's slowly drops through there. Uh, so that, that illustrates the decay process and you end up at any time there will be uh, some amount of the original form called the parent isotope and some amount of the decayed form. And if you do some calculations uh, with the physical process that's gone on there, you can figure out what percentage of it has decayed and therefore how long did that process take. Okay, but it's really a little bit more complicated than that. Once you get that general picture, you can start looking at some more details. Uh, first of all, you don't know what the starting amount was on either the parent isotope or the daughter isotope. So you have to make some assumptions about that and and because uh, you have to put those numbers into the equations to calculate the date. Again, in real nature, it's not in a glass, isolated in a glass bulb like this. Uh, it's in rocks and rocks are porous to some degree. And uh, all these metals that form these isotopes, they're all form salts that are easily dissolved in water going through there. So you have to account for uh, more, either the parent or daughter coming in from the outside from somewhere else, or some leaving that system, okay? So you have to make all these things, totally you have to make seven uh, assumptions that you cannot know as fact. Okay, let's look at some uh, things that would indicate that those are significant, not just theoretical. If you look at volcanoes, they have this magma coming up out of it and it, it solidifies and uh, you, when you date the, magma, the uh, lava flow, it's supposed to be the date since solidifications took place. But if we look here, uh, we see from Mount Etna, for example, there's uh, a fairly tight group, at least it's all in the hundreds of thousands, uh, this, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, it erupted 200 years ago, several pulses, 
One of it's two million, uh, 1.6 million years old, and the next one was 22 million years old. Uh, of course, neither one of them are 200 is the correct value, not 22 million. Uh, Kilauea, uh, these, this is known history about when those uh, eruptions took place. Some of them got 43 million, 30 million, 21 million, 700,000. None of that is anything like the actual history. And it's wrong by big amounts. Uh, this happens many times. This is, this is not just picked examples. Okay, let's look at another possibility. Here's cut away the Grand Canyon again. In the western part of the Grand Canyon that nobody gets to visit, there are some volcanoes that run down into the canyon sometime in the past. They dammed it up, something like 900 feet deep. A lake formed behind it and overtopped it and eventually cut down through it back down to the Colorado River's uh, channel. Now, it is not, Colorado River has not cut much lower than that, so that they, we know that this is the most recent thing in the canyon. And geologists uh, variously estimate that it might be, oh, 10,000 years old, or maybe as much as 100,000 years old. But it's not millions, obviously. But the professional dating labs have, have dated this many times because they, they, they can see the superposition of what the age relationships are here. Uh, Potassium argon gives, well, 0.01 million years is 10,000, but other uh, same technique gives, us up, gives up to 17 million. Uh, rub rubidium stronium ages gives 1,270 million to 1,390 million, over a billion years old. Uh, now, the rubidium stronium isochrone ages cyclochrome technique is more sophisticated and eliminates more variables, supposedly. But it gives about the same kind of ages. And the lead lead isochrome sophistication gives twice that error. So uh, you see, these things do not give you any kind of accurate representation of the true age of that thing at all. This is not all that uncommon. So, okay, let's go ahead. Uh, if you ask the professionals, well, how can this be? How can that be that wrong? And they list three things. Uh, a creationist PhD friend that I studied under a little bit said he actually wrote letters to the three leading uh, dating experts and ask them, how can this be? And here's the three things they came up with. Each one of them came up with a different one of these. Partial melting in the magnet changer, where the um, volcanic stuff comes from. All right, if, if some of it melts and gets more heat than another part of it melts, then it can shift around the isotope ratios. Uh, melting rock, when it, the magma comes up through a channel, it melts some of the uh, surrounding rock and uh, ice that changes the isotope ratios. Inconsistencies in the mantle magma source. Uh, different parts of the Earth's mantle have different amounts. They've always assumed it was uniform everywhere else, so-called well mixed. But in fact, it's not, as the volcanoes show. So all these factors the real interesting point is that all of these factors are in play everywhere you have magma coming up. You always have these air sources. It's only a question of how much of which one and uh, what combination. So given that, we should expect all kinds of errors. We should expect them. It's not reliable. Or we should at least ask some real serious questions about uh, uh, verifi verifiability when they do this kind of stuff. 
Okay. Let me come back to that a minute. Oh, well, let's review a little bit. We have uh, dinosaur bones up here with soft tissue in it, and it has C14 in it too. Both of those say it's say it young. We have C14 all throughout the geologic column. It says the whole thing's young. We find that the dating used to say that this is billions of years old, we just saw is pretty fallacious. Uh, not necessarily in every possible case, but it's, there's good reason to be concerned about uh, uh, any case can be way off. So that's not much to be trusted. Uh, not doing too bad on time. Uh, let's go on one more issue. Another thing that uh, creation scientists have worked on is dating granite rock. This is half known in Yosemite National Park. Very famous piece of granite, but all of the um, Sierra Nevadas are this kind of rock. A lot of the Rocky Mountains and a lot of the Appalachian Mountains. So this is a big problem. It's assumed uh, conventionally that this stuff is like a billion years old. But there's a little crystal, uh, granite is made up of a conglomeration of different kind of uh, minerals that crystallize at different times and form, form this granular structure. The first one to, to solidify and form a crystal is called zircon. It's the highest temp melting temperature mineral. Funny thing happens when it, when it begins to crystallize, it starts pulling in all the heavy atoms like uranium and thorium and so on. So it pulls in all the, the radioactive stuff. And if uh, there are teeny crystals and they're all throughout it, and when it solidifies and cools, it is a most excellent, excellent container. It's very hard to get anything in or out. So it more perfectly approximates that hourglass analogy. Okay. The only thing is you don't know what it started with, but there's something else going on in there. When it goes through the uranium de decay chain and gets finally to lead, it's stable end product. In that process, it kicks out eight helium atoms. So if you can measure how much decay product you had in there, you can determine how much helium was generated. And people who studied this have found out that there's way too much helium, much more than expected. So the helium diffuses out. It's about the only thing that can get out. Helium is a little bitty, the tiniest atom. It's only, it's, uh, only hydrogen is tinier. Uh, but helium is a noble gas, so it doesn't enter into chemical reaction, so it doesn't get captured by anything. It's free to wiggle around in the uh, crystal lattice, so it, it diffuses out fairly fast. So in effect, you have two clocks in there. If you can measure time with this helium diffusion process or with the uranium decay process. So, Nobody had ever measured uh, accurately the, how fast helium diffuses through this unusual zircon mineral. So creation scientists in the RAPE research project uh, formed two models. Here's one f uh, for the diffusion rates over here. This is diffusion rate uh, versus inverse the temperature. These are the diffusion rates you'd have to expect to have a billion year old rock, okay? And these, and this green line is the diffusion rate you'd have to have if it was 6,000 year old rock. Okay, now they sent these zircons off to the world class 
the world's best uh, expert on measuring diffusion at the University of Colorado. They did it through a third party so you didn't, wouldn't know that there's a bunch of creationists. Okay, even if, even if, even if this creationist had a bunch of PhDs along with them, uh, it would prejudice them. So he went and for a bunch of money, he contracted to, to measure the diffusion rate, the amount of helium in these crystals and the diffusion rate out. So uh, these black dots, blue dots, whatever they are, are his measurement results. And it is obvious they fit very well the young Earth model, the young creation model. Not one single data point gets anywhere within a factor of 100,000 of the old Earth model. Okay? Now, all these came from one location. That's a, so one of the things that is, is being now is replicating this kind of research. This is a lot of trouble, a lot of expense to go to. But they're replicating this in a number of other sources of granite where there is some knowledge of the thermal history of it. So this is another issue where uh, some real important research is coming to that same conclusion again. And this is hard science. This is not somebody's speculation. Okay. We can observe that uh, efforts are underway to replicate, uh, refine the results, and you need more researchers doing more independent work. You need more sample sources and uh, location studies. You need both secular and creation scientists communicating about the work that they're doing, studying their own preferred um, approach to things. Basically, the most valid approach to science is examination and testing of multiple contrasting models. Not looking at just one, well, I know this is right, that's something I'm going to bother with. No, when you look at um, uh, multiple models and contrast the strengths and weaknesses of them, then you start learning a lot more than you did otherwise. And you start re letting uh, iron sharpen iron, so to speak. So this is the way to go. In fact, a similar approach is good for the church, too. Uh, where scripture does not tell us exactly and explicitly what is true, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does, but when it does not, we should examine and test multiple contrasting models and be open to new discoveries. All of us. And we need to always remember the Lord's command to his followers. John 15, 34. This I command you to love one another. Doesn't say go, doesn't say belittle one another. It says love one another. So uh, we need to end this creationist backbiting it goes on sometimes and follow the Lord's direction. Okay. Here's a resource. If you really have interest in it, anybody, you want to look into these kinds of issues some more. Here's a book written by this Rate Research Project team member. He's a professor of physics, he teaches undergraduates. He has his PhDs in nuclear physics. Uh, this is really good. This is on your, this is one of the resources listed on your handout, or one on the table. Okay, Dr. Don Young, thousands, not billions. And he, he goes over a lot more material than I have. So, great stuff. If you know some scientists, Here's the version for them. This is the actual research report. Uh, it's 800 pages of uh, procedures, calculations, measurements, data, and so on. 
Uh, I think this book curved price is $34, so it's, it's a little bit heavy. Uh, 800 pages is a little heavy, too. But this is just the thing for scientists that are saying, you, you, it can't be. <laughs> well, here's the go-to place. All right, I guess that's a pretty good stopping point, or if we got another five minutes, I can make another point. Whichever. Okay, let's look at one more little thing. You might look at some of these dates, uh, see 14 ages, and say, well, 20, 30, 40,000 years? That doesn't really fit with young Earth creation either. So let me show you how that might operate. Um, this is C14 dating, and we have a, a chart here where time across this scale. And on this, we have C14 ratios. And I've drawn in three sample values here, okay? 0 0.03, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, these are all in the range we've been talking about. These curved lines are the physical process of the K. So uh, for this sample, in the past, it had to be decaying and end up on that value. For this one, it had to be decaying along this line and end up that value. So we can trace back this, and this is today's percentage of carbon rate C14 in the atmosphere. So the C14 came from the atmosphere to begin with. You can go back here and look where this intersected that, and that's the date that started, that process started. You can look at this one, go back until we get that intersection, and that's the date that that process started, and so on. Um, so, that, that's the way C14 goes. But what if this wasn't constant in the past? That's the way uniformitarians think. Anyway, if in, assume, instead of assuming this, we said, no, there's a flood uh, about 4,300 years ago, and the, before that, there was very little C14 due to, say, 10 times the plant material, 10 times the biosphere taking stuff out of the atmosphere, or that the cosmic great density was different prior to that time, then uh, at the flood, you kill off all that plant mass, then the C14 value would rise up to this new equilibrium that we measure today. Okay? So now when we we extrapolate back along the decay process, we intersect this line, and it would indicate that date shortly after the flood. So what, the, what is normally measured by the line labs as being 19,000 years ago, if there was a flood event and it included a process like that, then that would indicate that uh, it is 4,224 years ago, okay? So you see what a difference it makes in the assumptions you make. If you assume that there was no flood, you do something like this, and you get these tens of thousands of year date, and that's what the dating labs do. But if you assume that there's a flood process in here, like the Bible says, then you get dates that are consistent with that. An extremely important concept. So that's what the GHCA is all about. Thanks. You have questions now? Yes, sir. I assume the evolutionary chain is much, much greater than 70,000 years, correct? Excuse me? The justification for evolution is much, much longer than 70,000 years, and all of your research seems to me that 70,000 yeah, years. The, the first life would have occurred in their thinking 540 million years ago. That's right. Hmm. And it took 540 million years to go from an amoeba or a pair to an ape to a homo sapien. Is that their contention? That's, that's a roughly their convention. 
There's no way that could have happened in 70,000 years. No. Absolutely. I, I, I don't believe that it, it's common descent. I don't believe it all came from. I think it was created about 1,600 years before the flood. Supernaturally created. Okay. And then the flood reworked the entire surface of the earth. Completely reworked the geology. So you're saying that it happened 1,600 to 2,000 years before the birth of Christ? What is the it you're referring to there? The creation. The creation of man. The, the, yeah, the creation of man, the cre creation of the whole shebang. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, it, the creation of the whole shebang would be about 4,000 years before, just in round numbers. Now, there are some creations, uh, they would argue, well, it was really a little bit longer than that, maybe up to 10,000 years. Okay. They would take the geologies and say, well, you could have some gaps in there so you could get some more time in. But uh, not a lot more than that. Okay. All right. Well, make sure you get a handout. If you're interested in our newsletter, sign up for that over there, and I'll put you on the mail list. And when you get tired of it, you can unsubscribe. Uh, that's automatic. So uh, I hope uh, you, you come out, come out and see us sometime. Uh, Y'all could carpool with Pat. Come on. All right. Thank you.